Hello again, welcome to another design challenge. Uh, this week's concept is, <laughs> it's a pumpkin. <laughs> I can explain. So if you've ever had creative block, you might know what I've been facing here for this last week. It's been creative block, but I've been able to identify exactly what my block has been. So yeah, it's August. We don't really celebrate Halloween here. And my block has been a pumpkin with a face. So here we are, we're gonna do it, let's go. So the concept sketches were pretty simple this time around in that I knew that it was basically going to look like roughly the same shape from every angle. It was basically just sort of a fancy modified ball. Uh, I knew that I wanted to have eight segments and I knew that I wanted to do the face as like this indented thing. Cause I'd seen plenty of ones with the, the face shape sewn on, but I hadn't seen any with any kind of indentations happening. And while there are all kinds of variations on the theme out there, I did want to go with the very traditional orange. Even though that I'd done these concept sketches from the different angles and they could really count as the diagrams if I needed them to, I wanted to just do a quick sort of sketch out on how I was going to approach this. So like I knew what I wanted it to look like and then I needed to work out how I was going to do it, where I was going to start uh, and what it was going to end up, how I was going to end up constructing it. So I knew I wanted to work it in as like an eight segment shape uh, and you can see that, that, I've, that I literally drew sort of like the four intersecting lines to, to create sort of the, the pumpkin sketch to begin with. And in, in, by doing that and knowing that I wanted those slices to be generally the same for the start and for the end, I only had to focus on what I was doing in, in each individual slice. I only had to work out how to grow that slice and make that one sort of wedge perfectly and then just mirror it around eight times. All right, yeah, so I didn't have much of an idea of what other dimensions to really include in this one. So I knew that I wanted it to be sort of this big. I wanted it to fit into the palm of my hand. I didn't want it to be huge. I don't like to do huge things. And I already knew that there was sort of a lot of circles in my future for this particular one. Uh, the stem, I was gonna let sort of organically form. I knew I wanted it to be about five centimeters. So also I just did a quick little map out of the face. Basically, yeah, I had to plan the negative space. So I had to plan the holes that I wanted to leave and then plan what was, gonna, what was going to go in there and, and, and make the actual recess itself. So when I pulled all of the oranges out of my stash, it turns out that I had quite a few of them. So I started out by removing any of the cottons. I prefer to work in acrylic for things like this. Uh, acrylic has better friction, it locks together better. I just think it's a better foundation wall for this kind of thing. Then I removed any that were just the wrong color. They didn't read pumpkin to me. And that left me with three pretty decent acrylic options. Um, all around the same kind of ply, all around the same kind of weight. So they were all gonna work up to roughly the same size. So that wasn't a consideration. So it really kind of just came down to color and finish. So I got rid of the shiny one right away. I didn't, I didn't want a shiny pumpkin, which left me with kind of a brown orange and it's a very bright saturated orange. And I actually ended up going with the bright saturated orange. So from there, like the rest of the color scheme was basically a brown for the stem and some black and white to use for the inset features. All right, so starting with the orange first, because I knew that I wanted to make the base of the pumpkin, all of the other pieces were smaller, way more easy to sort of size up and down as I needed. So they knew, I knew that I wanted to make the more complicated piece first. Uh, all right, sometimes the struggle is real in trying to get the center of your yarn out, but I did finally find the end so I could get started. So because I was working with, to build up to eight real wedges to the circle, I actually started with a base eight. Normally I start with a base six, like as in like six stitches and then working up by six stitches evenly to get a flat but this time I was trying it by an eight. It's not something that I've done very often. Now I was making it a point to use stitch markers for this one here, just because I was working with an unfamiliar base, an unfamiliar shape. I was making it up as I go and I knew that I needed to repeat whatever I was doing eight times around. So basically it looks a bit silly at this smaller stage, but as it got bigger and those stitch markers helped me identify very easily the starting point and the ending point of each wedge, it made it a lot easier for me to work out exactly how many stitches I had to work with and, 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 and change the shape accordingly. So you can see that I'm drawing sort of little wedge diagrams as I go to just really keep track of the stitches and where I wanted the growth to be because I did want to end up with like a curved edge as well. I didn't want them to like grow out a weird shape. They needed to have be like a curved wedge to the, to the, to the pie slice. So by drawing little diagrams at some of the rows, it, it helped me identify where I needed to keep growing. So why a pumpkin? Well, I just got stuck on this idea of a pumpkin, right? But it wasn't any, any pumpkin. It had to be a pumpkin specifically with these indentated, 
indented, indented, the, with indented eyes. And uh, yeah, um, I played previously with this, this, this concept you can do where basically if you inset eyes, you can make it look like they are following you around the room. And I wanted to play with that a little bit. Now you'll see it's looking a little bit like a wavy mess at this point. Now we are stitching in, the, the, the aim of this was to stitch in those indentations. Uh, I knew that I would probably have to go back in and like stitch through to provide like a real sunken, sunken look, but I did want to stitch in some of that form just to, to provide guidelines and make sure that they sat evenly when I did want to stitch them in at the end. And so I was expecting this kind of wavering because there's currently too many stitches for it to lie flat. So we were coming up to a point where I was going to have to start leaving the spaces for the face to go in. Uh, so I, I popped the, the orange aside and I sort of mapped out exactly what I wanted the face to look like. I started with, I knew that the, the eyes, I wanted just them to be fairly basic, just circle holes that I was going to leave. Uh, and the mouth, I was also going to try and keep it a pretty basic shape as well. So you can play with this concept a little bit by sort of changing the, the, the shape of the gaps that you're leaving, but because I wasn't completely certain that this idea was even going to be executable, I wanted to keep it pretty simple to start with. My, my approach when it comes to things like this, you might've seen me do this in the B video for the wings as well. Basically you draw what you're trying to do and you draw it over a grid or in, in this case I put a grid on afterwards and then you just trace around the squares that best fit the lines you're trying to draw and you'll end up with like this, the pixel, the square, the crochet equivalent of, of the rounded shape you were trying to draw and it just makes it really really easy and from there you just kind of have to work out how many stitches you want it to cover. Uh, I do try to match the, the rows, row by row to what I'm trying to do. Makes it a lot easy, easier. So then I went through and I added some numbers in and the, like those numbers corresponded to the stitches I needed to skip. And from there, I basically had a very easy map to follow as to where I wanted to leave that negative space. And you can do that with any shape. Uh, just because I've done it for eyes and, and a mouth here for gaps I wanted to leave, in, in the B video, I did it for where I, the stitches I actually wanted to make. So it's just a really easy way to basically translate anything into a flat piece of crochet. But then I got right back into the pumpkin and it was with renewed energy because I knew that there was at least something interesting coming up, the, 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 the placing of this space. All right, so as you can see, we have started to put the indentation, put the indentation. We've started to skip steps. We've started to skip stitches, skip stitches. That's hard to say, okay. We've started to skip stitches now uh, to, to leave those gaps where I'm going to put the little inset pieces in. And the way I am doing managing that here is I'm, gonna, I'm using long chains. And then basically I am using sort of the following rows to help inset them further back by doing something that I am personally referring to as a, like a special single crochet, where I do the last single crochet before the gap around both the chain from the previous row, just to hold it back from the, from the opening, uh, as well as through the stitch itself. And then I do my chains across to the other side. So in doing that, basically I didn't end up in a big tangle of chains and I, I still had those skip stitches exactly where I needed them to be without having to like stop and then restart because I hate stopping and restarting. I am a one strand kind of girl. If I have to frog something, I want to be dealing with a single strand. I don't want to have to be like, tying all the little bits together. Uh, no, don't have time for that, loses too much yarn. So chaining across, used a little bit more yarn than maybe stopping and starting would have, but if I, and I did, have to go back and unravel and try something again, I didn't have to worry about pieces. Okay, so the eyes were approached the same way as the mouth again. Uh, it's just there was two openings that I was leaving on the same row instead of just one. Uh, That's where my little map came in really handy because I knew how many stitches to skip, how many stitches in between them, and it just basically made the whole thing very straightforward. At this point we were coming up to the end of the eyes and then finishing off those last few rows and so I needed to start thinking about how I was going to finish off the pumpkin. Now because I wanted the indentations at the top to match the indentations at the bottom. And for the most part, I'd managed to keep my stitch savers in the exact same stitch the whole way up uh, without, without spiraling them too much, even though I wasn't necessarily using them as markers throughout the body of it. By keeping them in the same place, I had the same points of reference when it came to working on how to like close the top off as I had for closing, like when I initially started at the bottom. Because I wanted to have that sort of 
have it actually be a reflection and have those indentations form as well at the top. What I basically did is you, I, I was working backwards. So for every row that I wrote at the start, if it said increase, I changed it to a decrease. And you basically work your way back up through those rows and you end up mirroring however you, like the way you started, you end up mirroring it as you finished it. And it's just a, a neat little trick. You don't have to try and work out the math or the spacing twice. Uh, if you've increased, like if, you, if you've done like a progression of two single crochet and then an increase, you can just flip that and like to, to mirror it and, and have it go in the opposite direction. You do two single crochet and a decrease and you end up working your way back down through those rows and you end up with a, a mirror image. So you'll be able to see me start to do it here. Now I'll admit that my, my, my stitch marker management got a little out of control here and uh, they ended up flying all over the place and I, at one point I got too lazy to close them off every single time because it was catching on my thumbnail and it was just really irritating to have to do eight times a row for however many rows I was at, up to at this point. Uh, and they started falling out and I started having to like work from memory to work out how many stitches in there was supposed to be. But we made it work. Like we, we, we got them back in roughly where they were supposed to go. It didn't turn out too badly. So because I knew I was gonna to have to attach the rest of the face pieces, I couldn't finish off the actual pumpkin part at this point. So we, we set it aside, we swapped to a new page and we were working out exactly how to create these pieces that we were going to attach on the inside, not on the outside, on the inside. Uh, you can see here that I've gone with the yellow because uh, I did want to give that some candle illusion as though he had a candle inside him. So even though later it ends up getting swapped to the white, uh, because like the yellow just wasn't picking up enough light for you to actually see it properly. I do kind of regret swapping to the white. I wish I'd stayed with the yellow. It's nicer. I like it better. It would have been, it would have been better. Like sometimes you end up with a few small regrets from designing and, and this is, this is one of mine. I wish I'd stayed with the yellow. So basically, yeah, after the, the doing the very center as the pupil, um, I, I, I worked up a couple of rows of black. Uh, there is one fewer row of black in the pattern that I've produced. The link is in the description below, by the way. So after work, I, I, do, I included one fewer row of black just so that you didn't have to do the correction that I end up having to do, which is adding an additional pupil in over the top so that you can actually see them. But if you wanted deeper eyes, you just add more of those straight rounds. Uh, and I did finish off with a row of orange so that when I attach it to the outside pumpkin, it becomes a seamless kind of transition instead of what could have, yeah. The, so the row of orange just helps it blend smoothly into the overall pumpkin. From there, I went on to the mouth. Now the mouth I did work in a flat piece. See me working out my, my little little chart there. So basically I just counted the amount of, the number of stitches that would fit around that opening. You, I also referred back to my original face graph, which, which showed exactly how big it should end up being. And from there, I, I just worked up a flat piece that was the, the size and the shape that I needed. Now, I did make a fairly shallow mouth because I, I wasn't trying to do anything too fancy with it, but there, there is the option there that if you did want to try sort of a more complicated monster mouth or if like, you want to put like some more teeth in there or a tongue or just make it more of a character, you would, yeah, you would literally just add more rows around the outside of the mouth uh, to make it further recessed, like recessed further back. So I was only going for a shallow one. There is plenty of options there that you can use to make it deeper. All right, so yeah, then I start, then I basically pinned those pieces in place just on the inside of those openings and then matching stitch for stitch. This is really important because it helps it let, like not stand out as badly. It's, it gives you a really nice polished finished product. Match, sew, stitch through stitch. Don't just sew it on any anyway. So I, I attached both of the eyes. He looks kind of happy in a creepy kind of way, don't you think? He's a bit more of a, <laughs> he's more of a squash than a pumpkin right now. Okay, so you can see I also d did the row of orange around the mouth just to allow that transition as well. Just around the bottom lip though, because the top lip was not going to be visible. And once again, matching stitch for stitch, sewed it, sewed it on the whole way around. Now, when I reached the top, I decided I didn't like just the toothless look. He was reading a little grandparent for me. And part of that might've been that I hadn't stuffed him and seen what he would look like, but he looked very sort of toothless elder. Uh, and so I decided to sort of lean into the monster curve a little bit at this point, which is why this video is Monster Pumpkin, not Jack-O-Lantern, uh, and add a couple of little happy fangs, and I'm really glad I did, honestly. I think he, it adds something to the overall pumpkin, which you would be able to see if I would hold the, 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 the thing under the camera, but I'm learning, I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> 
Though he looks a little like a Groot here, doesn't he? Except instead of Groot, he's like, I am root vegetable. Pumpkins aren't root vegetables. Um, no, pumpkins are not root vegetables. But it's still looking very smooth, you'll note. So you can see the indents at the top and the bottom, but around the middle, it's very smooth. And the face is very ninja turtle? I don't know, there's something too smooth and not, not right about it at this point. And so like we are going to go in and we're gonna add the indents that the pumpkins have. We're gonna add the, we're gonna make it into a pumpkin instead of an orange ball. So I tried so many ways of getting these indents in. I tried turning it inside out and stitching them in place and that really wasn't visible enough. It could have been, but it was going to be, require so much precision and it was going to very easily look dimpled and wrong. So I moved on from that idea fairly quickly. I tried using a piece of wire or a hook or a needle to th thread the piece of, of yarn through. And in the end, the needle was the best option. Um, sometimes it turns out that, you know, horses instead of zebras, the obvious answer is the correct one. So basically how I did all of these indents is working around the back, first of all. I basically thread a long piece of wool all the way up through and around, uh, tie it in a knot until it's squashed down, and then sort of in the end, you'll see me tuck all of the little ends back into the pumpkin itself so you can't see them. I knew an indent between the eyes is going to be necessary to sort of really, really finalize this look. So what I did is I threaded in the, the needle right above the top lip and I, I did the same thing where, with, as I did with the other segments where I, I threaded up and around and through. I then repeated the process for the bottom half of it, so lining it up the top line and the bottom line, just starting at the, just below the bottom lip and doing it out through the bottom and, and, and tying a knot and, and doing that indent that way. I then tucked all my ends in so that you couldn't see any of them. Okay, so last but not least, I had to design the stem and the piece to go on the bottom. So just out of brown, it was gonna be a pretty basic tube, but I wanted it to be a triangular prism. Uh, I wanted it to be a triangular-ish stem. It still ended up pretty round in the end because I didn't put a lot of stitching into making it triangular. So I worked it up into a triangle shape and I then I did a row of back post stitching just to give it that hard edge around the top. And then I added additional rows until I thought it looked to be about the right length. Okay, once it was done, I placed it over the hole in the top. I actually placed it slightly inside and then I stitched it in place. Okay, so last but not least, I had to make the little base of the pumpkin. Now this was really fun. I made a little circle and then I was doing basically a stitch, and then two chains and then a stitch all in the same stitch to give it like this little pointy star kind of look. It's always fun to do little pieces like that because I don't get to play with them very often. So here he is. He's creepy and I kind of like him. So the indented eyes the, with the, the, their ability to like follow you across the room a little bit, it doesn't really work because the light doesn't really get in there far enough. The openings are not big enough, but I still actually really like the way he turned out. He turned out a little bigger than I was expecting. I, I like the sort of irregular pumpkin shape that looks like a very organized kind of chaos look that we've got going here. I do really like sort of how the eyebrow ridge and the eye indentations worked out uh, and I did end up adding the teeth as you would have seen uh, to I don't know just monster him up a little bit I even like how his little stem turned out he ended up a little less jack-o-lantern a little more monster pumpkin but I still think that's thematically appropriate uh, well as appropriate as a jack-o-lantern can be in August so Okay guys, that's it for today. Please hit the like button if you enjoyed this and don't forget to subscribe. I put out new videos every Thursday and I would hate for you to miss one. Leave me a comment down below to let me know what I should do next. As you can see, I am willing to be completely seasonally inappropriate. Uh, and until next time, I'll see you later.